Hello and welcome to Daily Current Affairs by Neo IAS. Today is 1st September 2019 and the topics for discussion are Electors Verification Program EVP, Purana Kila that is the old fort, Oil Spillage, Uranium, Map Aided Program and previous year question revision series. Coming to our first topic which is Electors Verification Program that is EVP. This is the news because the EVP will be launched on September 1st that is today will and will continue till October 15th. Now, uh, this is a new initiative of the Election Commission of India, which aims to update the electoral rolls through participation from citizens. Now, through uh, this program, the citizens will have to make an account on the online portal and check the data available and verify the same. Okay, one can tag family members in the same account to verify and update the respective data. Both online and offline modes are also available for voters to participate in the EVP. While for online, a voter can go to the NSVP website or download the app for registration. For offline methods, citizens can approach the voter centers available in each assembly constituency or they can also visit the common service centers that are CSCs. Now each CSC will charge a nominal amount of 1 rupee for uploading a document and 2 rupee for uploading a photo. Now coming to our next topic which is Purana Kila that is the old fort in Delhi. Now the Purana Kila in Delhi has been built on the banks of the river Yamuna with its massive rubble wall and imposing gateway houses. The structure houses a mosque which has a double storied octagonal tower. So understand the structure of it. Now according to Hindu literature, the fort marks the site of Indraprastha that is the capital of the Pandavas. Now though the construction was carried out by an Afghan ruler and the Afghan ruler was Sher Shah Suri. Any time between the, uh, that is the time between is 1538 to 1545 in the 3rd century, okay, who rested on the throne of Delhi from the Mughal Emperor Humayun. So, Sher Shah Suri came after Humayun and he was the one who built it. Now, we will give a description about this. The fort is made up of red sandstone and has a length of 2 kilometers. The Purana Kila is another reminder of the bygone Mughal era, which excelled in architectural styles. You will know this. Mughal era has a lot of beautiful architectural styles which you will definitely study in the art and culture section of our history. Now the Purana Kila has three majestic gates. The first one is the Humayun Darwaza, the second one is the Bada Darwaza and the third one is the Talaki Darwaza and all are built on the red sandstone. The other attractions at the fort site are Kila Khoma, Masjid, Sher Mandal and the museum. Now the walls of the Purana Kila are made of enormous half fashioned stones with strong and thick walls. Ornament, ornamentation and decoration are minimal in this case of Purana Kila. Usually you will know the Mughal, uh, the Mughal architectures and certain Mughal buildings will have a lot of ornamentation on it and have various designs written on it. But in case of the Red Fort, the ornamentations are kept at a minimal. Now coming to our next topic which is oil spinach. Now this is the news because the piers of the oil spillage in the ecolo ecologically sensitive areas of Chilka Lake has started to diminish. Now uh, the thing is the oil spillage had occurred because one of the Malaysian, Malaysian ships had uh, grounded near the vicinity. So when it grounded, the oil from the ship had leaked and made an oil spill in that region. Now what happened is in the spreading of these oil, there is uh, harmful substances that is the oil and plastic and industrial agricultural waste are actually causing marine pollution in that area and since Chilka Lake is an ecologically sensitive zone, it is also harming the uh, ecologically uh, very vulnerable species in that region. You will also know about the Irrawaddy dolphins which are very special over there, endangered species which are also home, uh, taking Chilka Lake as its breeding ground. So it is also affecting those animals. Now we'll talk about the oil spillage. Now oil spillage are dangerous to marine food, okay. Now oil spillage is also an additional cause of problem irrespective of the normal seepage of oil from the earth also. Now with huge tankers knifing their way through the high seas and offshore oil drilling intensifying, oil pollution is an ever present threat. Therein we have oil spillage from ships itself and offshore oil drilling sites, you know, where they are drilling oil from the seabed. They are also causing seepage of oil uh, releasing to, leading to oil spillages. Now, up to two-thirds of an oil spill can evaporate in the first few days, okay. But before these toxic compounds evaporate, they kill fish, animal life and pose harm to the future generations. Now, this is a problem. Now, the thick oil washes ashore creating reservoirs on the beaches of toxic chemicals that can have lasting effects on the environment. You know, 
anything that stays in the ocean also has a tendency to go towards the ocean shore that is the beaches on the continental uh, mass and therefore if we have toxic waste that is or oil spills on the open seas it has a tendency to move into the beaches and once it moves into the beaches it actually causes pollution on the beaches that is actually affecting us and all the organisms in those sensitive areas you know beaches can be an example of ecotone right it's a balance between the continental environment and the oceanic or marine environment so ecotone areas are also put in the harm because of oil spills now we'll talk about what happens to marine life now the immediate impact of an oil slick is the mass death of fish turtles and birds you can understand that why fish you know cannot uh, you know properly breathe because you know it stops in the sunlight from coming in so the oxygen demand also lowers down and same is the case of turtles and in case of birds you know the birds some birds actually you know they find food source over the marine waters by diving into the waters and catching fish and coming out but in this case when there is oil spills they cannot fly because once they dive in their feathers are you know covered with oil so after that they can't fly, fly and they, what happens is therefore they fall back into the water they drown and they die and it is not the case with just one or two birds it happens on a very ma massive scale so that is a problem with it now because the oil forms a film on the surface it reduces the amount of light and oxygen passing into the water now this suffocates the marine life and makes it to go into a special state called heat coma you understand uh, because oxygen is not released and more and more carbon dioxide is released carbon dioxide actually contains more takes in more heat so what happens after an oil spill generally the temperature of the water in that region actually increases now the marine uh, organisms in that region actually suffocate to death and that kind of uh, uh, death is caused by this one special state what you call as heat coma now the toxic chemicals leaching from the oils and some of the oil itself sink to the seabed damaging the coral reefs also you know very dense high dense oils are also present which actually de go down actually they don't actually not only float in the region they go down to the seabed and you know seabed also contains very sensitive organisms which are called corals they are also called the you know the rainforest of the oceans are these coral reefs so these oil spills are also affecting the life of the coral reefs now in 1973 the imo adopted the international convention for the prevention of pollution from ships now this is we'll talk about imo now imo stands for international maritime organization it is a specialized agency of the united nations responsible for the regulating of shipping established in the year of 1948 its headquarter is in london now india was one of the earliest members of the imo and it had joined the imo in the uh, year of 1959 Now the IMO's primary purpose is to develop and maintain a comprehensive regulatory framework for shipping. Now coming to our next topic which is uranium. Now this is a news because the Andhra Pradesh government had ordered a full fledged inquiry into a number of complaints about groundwater pollution caused by uranium mining and processing from the project of Uranium Corporation of India Limited at Tummalapalle in Vemula Mandal of Kapala district in Andhra Pradesh. Now uh, we'll talk about uranium. Uranium is a heavy metal which has been used as an abundant source of concentrated energy for over 60 years. Now uranium was first discovered in 1789 by Martin Klaproth. He and he was a German chemist and the mineral from which very obtained uranium that was called pitchblende. Now it was named uranium was named after the planet of Uranus. Understand that is how uranium the uh, material gets its name. It is named after Urania, uh, the planet Uranus, which was uh, first discovered eight years earlier to 1789. Now, about 11 percent of the world's electricity is generated from uranium in nuclear uh, reactors. Kazakhstan is the world's top producer for uh, uranium, followed by Canada and then Australia as the main suppliers of uranium in the world markets. Uranium is sold only to countries which are signatory. to the no nuclear non proliferation treaty that is npt and which allow international inspection to verify that its uses are only for peaceful purposes i want you to answer a question that i'm going to ask you here now find out if india is a part of don't find out just say yes or no if india is a part of this nuclear non proliferation treaty if yes tell why and if no also write down why india is not a part of the nuclear non proliferation treaty okay now we'll talk about uranium mining in india 
Now, the uranium mining in India made an exciting beginning with the formation of the Uranium Corporation of India Limited in 1967 under the Department of Atomic Energy. Now, uranium deposits occur in Singhbhum and Hazirabag district of Jharkhand, Gaya district of Bihar and in the sedimentary rocks in Saharanpur district of Uttar Pradesh. So, understand the regions where uranium is mined in India. Jadugada, Jaduguda in uh, Singhbhum Thrust Belt is the first uranium deposits in the country. Bhatin, Narvapahar and Turamin etc. are other uranium mines in Jharkhand. Now coming to our next area which is Map Aided Program. Today we will be continuing with the uh, Tiger Reserves in Karnataka. So today we will be talking about Nagarhole Tiger, Reser Tiger Reserve. We have already covered Nagarhole as a uh, national park. Tag Nagarhole is also a national park. So we will talk about it now. Now, the Nagarhole National Park, also called as Rajiv Gandhi National Park, is a national park located in the Koduka district and Mysore district of Karnataka. Koduka here stands for Kurg, the Kurg district of Karnataka. Now, it is one of India's premier tiger reserves along with the adjoining Bandipur Tiger Reserve. I covered Bandipur yesterday. You know, Bandipur and uh, this Nagarhole are adjoining uh, tiger reserves. Now, this park was declared the 37th tiger reserve of India in 1999 under Project Tiger. Now it is also part of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserves and I, if you remember what I said yesterday, Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve is the largest protected area in India with in the southern part of India. Now coming to the previous year question revision series, the question for today is consider the following crops in India. The first one is groundnut, sesamum and then finally comes to pearl millet. Which of the above are predominantly rain fed crops. So, you have to find the answer for that and write down in the comment section below. In addition to that, you have to also write down the answer for the question that I had asked you. Is India part of NPT, that is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? And if India is, tell me why. And if India is not, also give the reason as to why India is not a part of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Okay. So, this is the question that I had given yesterday. Consider the following crops. Uh, the first one is cowpen, second is green gram and finally, the third one is pigeon pea. Now, the question here is that which of the above uh, you know, crops in India are used as a pulses, fodder and green manure. So, uh, if you know a little bit of you know about agriculture, you understand that green gram is not used for fodder or you know uh, green manure. So, you can eliminate two here and so then the leftover options that you have is C and the correct option for this question is option C. So that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed the session. If you have any doubts or queries, write down in the comment section below. Thank you.